Hey everyone, I'm Richard. Looking ahead to the upcoming release of AMD's Polaris graphics architecture. Just like Nvidia's Pascal, Polaris is hugely significant. It combines a generational leap in the core Radeon technology with the move to 14 nanometer FinFET. So that's more transistors crammed onto the same area of silicon. And that translates into much more powerful graphics hardware. And on top of that, well, there are gonna be some significant power efficiency savings too. Let's start by looking at the hard data that AMD has released. First of all, there will be two Polaris chips from which multiple GPUs will be derived, Polaris 10 and Polaris 11. AMD is looking to build upon the success of its R9 Nano small form factor card by producing more products of the same ilk using fewer PCI Express power adapters. The drive for power efficiency also allows AMD to target current gen console performance for thin and light laptops. And this will be backed up by the latest hardware acceleration for media encode decode, meaning 4K 60 HEVC support plus HDMI 2.0 and HDCP 2.2. So no problems with Netflix 4K there. Polaris 10, well, that's the key area of focus here as it is the higher performing processor. We kind of know what we're getting with Nvidia's upcoming Pascal cards, replacements for GTX 970 and 980. And those will be high end offerings that really push performance. AMD's strategy, on the other hand, it's very different aiming for the mainstream market. My thought here, well, I think they are targeting R9 390 levels of performance, but they want to drive the price point there all the way down. In a recent interview, AMD's Roy Taylor talked about expanding the mainstream market, in particular for VR. Now, we know that the entry level spec there is GTX 970 and R9 290. So, Polaris 10 needs to be cheaper and it needs to offer the same ballpark power or preferably more of it. So what do we know about the hardware spec? Well, quite a lot actually, though the information is a little conflicted. The device ID for Polaris products was found in a Linux kernel submission. Put that into Google and some benchmark results appear. There's this one from SciSoft's benchmarking page confirming 2,304 shaders or 36 compute units running at only 800 megahertz. Performance looks pretty good, but perhaps a little subpar presumably owing to what is a relatively low clock. And then there's this GFX bench result, which says that the pre-production Polaris 10 is around 75 to 80% as fast as an R9290X. Assuming this is the 800 megahertz part, we can expect to see parity with the clocks bumped up to the rumored 1050 megahertz. And that's certainly what this leak seems to suggest. But we may well be looking at two Polaris parts here. Remember, both AMD and Nvidia release multiple graphics cards from the same core chips. Different speeds, different shader counts, and different price points, of course, but the same chip. Now, we should remember that this is just one benchmark using an OpenGL workload, no less. So this is not ideal. It can only really offer us the vaguest ballpark comparison. Gaming performance really does trump everything here. Now, the 36 compute units in Polaris 10, that's lower than the 40 found in the R9 390 and the 44 in the 390X. But AMD is promising us a generational leap in performance per CU, plus other key optimizations. There's also some conjecture that the Polaris bench data we have not only comes from a down clock sample, but also from, say, a Radeon R9 480 as opposed to a 480X with some believing that we'll get a full 40 compute units there. Combine that with higher clocks and we should achieve R9 390 performance or better. And assuming the price point is competitive there, I'd say that's gonna be pretty awesome. So what about Polaris 11? We know that it is the smaller chip, a kind of next gen successor to Pitcairn, which featured in everything from the Radeon HD 7850 and 7870 through to the most recent R9 370, and of course the PlayStation 4. Now, AMD can scale clock speed and power consumption there, so expect it to be both a laptop processor, but also maybe a lower end desktop GPU 
with faster clock speeds. Again, there are some OpenGL GFX bench results here, and in comparison with the Polaris 10 result, it would seem to indicate something in the region of 16 to 20 compute units. Something apparently confirmed by a CompuBench link, very much like the classic Radeon HD 7850 and 7870. Now, AMD itself has said that a Polaris chip, almost certainly 11, offers a 61% reduction in power consumption running Star Wars Battlefront at 1080p60 on medium settings, requiring 84 watts versus Nvidia's 140. But that's not really the sexy end of the GPU spectrum. Is AMD intent on leaving the high end to Nvidia in the short term? It seems so. Take a look at the firm's roadmap and you'll see a new star in AMD's sky. Vega, due in 2017, using HBM2. An unfortunate slip by an AMD engineer saw some of the Vega chip spec leaked on LinkedIn of all places. So we can see that the processor has the same 4096 shaders as Fury X. Bottom line though, AMD's high-end products for 2016 remain with the Fury line. So. That's what we know right now about everything related to Polaris. AMD's stated aim is affordable graphics cards with VR-capable performance in an effort to expand the market with lower-end GPUs that intend to outperform Nvidia with superior power efficiency. From our perspective, the only real crossover we can foresee would be the top-end Polaris 10 product up against the mooted GTX 1070. But that well, that's a discussion for another time. I'm all out of info here, so in the meantime, do like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video, and I'll be back soon with more. Thanks for watching.